Well, now back here, whatever solution is found to the current economic crisis, if indeed one can be found, we're going to be living in difficult times for a long while yet. Money or lack of it, trust or lack of it, hope or lack of it, shape our cultural world as much as they shape our politics. Pop art and pump music, for example, are inseparable from particular times. So what can we expect this unhappy era to throw up? Do hard times make good music or art? We thought it would be interesting to hear what Brian Eno, one of the world's foremost music producers and writers, thinks. Before we hear from him, though, Stephen Smith has this. It's Nick Clegg's one-time advisor on youth issues, in his own salad days, as the keyboard noodler-in-chief of art rocker's Roxy Music. His outfits were enough to catch your eye, or even have it out. Don't think the roof's leaking down at Eno's lab. No, it's the sound of ambient music. The composer's been applying his cool alchemy to this often misunderstood genre. Well, you think of him as, as the rock and roll boffin, you know, the chrome-domed, lateral genius of, of music. His, his CV is pretty impressive, starting from Roxy Music, his own wild and strange solo years, and then as a producer for uh, multi, multi-million selling albums by people like U2 and Coldplay. He's a, a little maverick genius burrowing around on the fringes of rock and roll has produced some of the most interesting work of the last 30 or 40 years. Do grim times produce great music? Well, Eno may be in a position to know. When he was producing David Bowie's legendary Berlin albums in the 70s, Britain was convulsed by strikes. In 1980, the year of Ronald Reagan becoming president, the producer was working with seminal American outfit Talking Heads. The theory that poverty equals interest in culture is not necessarily one I'd like to pursue because I'd rather people weren't poor. But obviously, when you have a situation like this, it makes people angry and it makes people frustrated if they're not depressed. And that means they're going to do something. Whether or not uh, it takes the form of the riots that we've seen, or whether or not it takes the form of people making music, or whether or not it takes the form of other kind of protests, I think music is a great form of communication. And I would always hope that people would make music and will make music to accompany these hard times. I'm sure they will. I think it'll be very exciting. As to how Brian Eno makes music, with U2 and others, we sense it's not by turning all the knobs up to 11. He's been known to issue his musicians with cryptic little notes. Sometimes I just write on bits of card, rhythm, melody, percussion, something like that. He has these cards that he, would, he invented, that he, he would produce, and they would just have words on them, you know, like blue or brain or uh, tomorrow or side salad, I don't know what. And he produces these cards during the studio and the musicians have to, you know, play side salad, play blue. They might all get different cards. And it's, it was a way of pushing people out of their box. Coldplay released an album helmed by Mr. Eno at the time of the banking crisis. That's the last banking crisis. Hmm. Have we hit a snag with the theory that troubled times bring forth great music? <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, everybody's got to pay the bills. And also, if you're asked to do something, uh, it's very pleasant, you know, and you, if you're asked to do something, you often do it. Um, I don't have a problem with uh, Eno producing Coldplay or U2. Um, he does plenty of other stuff besides um, that is interesting. Eno remains endlessly inventive. His latest idea he calls generative music, in which a computer sequences programmed sounds. I like it, but I'm not sure it's the Christmas number one. 
And the uh, chrome-domed maverick genius, or whatever it was, is here now. Uh, <laughs> With side salad. How is it chrome-dome? Chrome-dome. <laughs> <laughs> no. Tell me, this theory about difficult times making interesting music, do you buy it? I think difficult times make for good audiences. Because I think, I think when the times are difficult, people are much more interested in art. They're much more interested in seeing things, in being challenged in new ways, in finding exciting new feelings. And in comfortable times, people aren't very much. Do you think it's happening now? Yes, I do. I think there's, there's much more live performance than there's been ever in my life. And, of course, there are all these new arts that are appearing now, um, mm. a lot of them internet-based or app-based, which really are very, very exciting. And I, I think that's the beginning of the future. And I, th I think, you know, the conventional art forms are sort of losing their funding in some respects, but creativity is it's a little bit like water. It sort of seeps out wherever there's an outlet, you know. And it's, you're talking about musical expression of creativity here, or is it broader than music? Uh, broader, I think, yes. You know, there are a lot of things going on now that you have to look at all of the new art forms a little bit like you have to imagine it's 1911. You're looking at the first films that are made. It's very difficult to imagine when you see a s sort of flickering train going into a station that that's going to turn into Martin Scorsese or, or um, Citizen Kane or something like that. But there are lots of new art forms that are appearing now. What um, are these art forms? Well, for instance, um, there's a whole lot of things based around apps, you know, the, the yeah. little iPad. Now the fact that everybody carries um, a computer in their pocket means that an artist has a new place to work, and a lot of them are taking advantage of it, including me, actually. <laughs> um, are you taking advantage of it at a visual level, a musical level, or what? Both of those, I think, yes. I think... Um, so somehow it's all scrambled up together? Yes. Uh, that's one of the things that's going on, actually, that the distinctions between the arts are starting to break down, that, there's, that everything's much more porous. It's possible to work in, in a new landscape that is both visual, musical, textual, if you like. Everything's porous and everything's available too, isn't it? Everything's available, including the complete history of recorded art. That's, that's one of the other things. So something I notice with young musicians is that their palette is enormously broad. You know, they're quite capable of bringing in Dave Brubeck and Bob Marley and Talking Heads into one piece of music and collaging them together. So one of the problems an artist face now is, uh, faces is to decide what form am I working in? What am I actually doing? I didn't have that problem in a way. I sort of inherited the idea of being a particular kind of musician and I expanded it a bit, but I, I never was looking at 50 years past of music as my um, palette. And they're all equally available, and they're all kind of equal, considered equally worthwhile, whether it be Dave Brubeck or Beethoven or whoever. Well, I, th I think, do you know this term open source? It, it refers yeah. to a way of constructing things, of creating things by sharing them. I think, in a way, the whole, the whole cultural world has sort of gone open source, so that everybody's making things, making them available to be shared. As soon as they're digital, they're very shareable. It's very easy to... Um, uh, bind together things that are already digital and this this idea of open source which sort of loses the idea of the artist as the primary controlling individual and the artist becomes more like a, a member of a commune so so artists are working more and more in communities and I think people are as well. But is there a particular type of sound that emerges from that synthesis at the end? I mean, in the way that you can associate punk, for example, with a particular time in our history? Well, I, th I think, though, I don't like to blow my own trumpet, that this <laughs> blow idea away. of generative music that I talk about is one of the things that will prove to be a feature of the future. Um, the idea of um, the composer being more like a gardener than than an architect. You know, the, the vision of the composer traditionally is somebody who has the whole piece in their head and writes it down. Whereas I think more and more what people are doing now is assembling sets of musical seeds and planting them, seeing, watching them develop, watching them evolve, both electronically and, both, uh, and through sharing with other composers and musicians. So, so I think we're in a, 
you know, Cameron talks about the big society, but actually it's here. We're, we're already doing it, in fact. We won't recognize it for a long time, but there's a sort of exponential expansion of the thing that um, I think Matt Ridley identified in, in his book, The Rational Optimist, the idea of the growth of a collective mind, the idea of people becoming more and more intelligent by sharing in a larger and larger collective mind. Do you know that our brains are actually getting smaller? That's an alarming thought on which to end, <laughs> I think. Brian, you know, thanks.